प्रिंस सर प्लीज बिगिन ओके हेलो एम आई ऑडिबल सर या या यस सर सो गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीवन द आवर व्यूअर्स फ्रॉम पारी यूनिवर्सिटी डियर स्टूडेंट्स टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू ऑर्गेनाइज दिस वेबिनार and uh, today's host the assistant professor nirali mam and now i'd like to invite nirali mam to brief about our guest speaker hello good afternoon one and all myself nirali hasalkar from parul university good afternoon dear sir sir uh, today it's my pleasure to in, uh, introduce you Uh, dear students, today we have uh, Dr. D. L. Shah, retired professor from M. S. University, Vadodara, as our uh, expert uh, expert. So he has completed his pro uh, post graduation in 1979 and PhD in 1988 in the field of geotechnical engineering from M. S. University. He has worked as an assistant engineer from 1978 to 83 uh, in. <clears throat> Gary Vadodara. After that, his uh, uh, designation has changed to assistant research officer at the same place uh, for the next four years. And after that, he has moved to BVM Engineering College uh, in uh, Vallabh Vidyanagar for next two years as an assistant professor. In the year of 1988, he came to MS MS University Baroda, and he uh, he stays. Uh, there till the uh, till the at the time of retirement in uh, 2017 with the experience of more than 20 years as a professor he has published uh, four books and more than uh, 125 research paper published under his name uh, which will be definitely give the guidance for the researchers and uh, moreover he has won uh, uh, won 16 various awards and prizes in uh, in his career and uh, uh thank you so much sir for coming uh, uh, uh coming through with us uh, via this webinar series uh now i uh, sir you can start your uh, talk sir okay thank you so thank you nirali friends for introduction introduction my Welcome, pleasure sir. sir so good afternoon one and all and i also thanks to parul institute for inviting me for the guest lecture my special thank to dr lalit for inviting me so before i start my actual presentation on expansive soil i have few slides just to understand why the soil characteristics are different from place to place so if you examine the earth crust you can see over here there are so many elements are there usually o s i and a l they are the major constitution and after that uh, there are again f e c a n a etc etc in uh, some proportion so you can see there are varieties of the chemical constitutions are available and basically there are three types of rock igneous sedimentary and metamorphic everybody is knowing about that so i am not going to that detail these rock are get weathered either by mechanical weathering or by chemical weathering mechanical weather, uh, weathering due to loading unloading frost, frost action organization growth abrasion effect chemical weathering may be due to hydration oxidation carbonation these are the chemical reactions that takes place this also students has uh, studied during his undergraduate class or maybe at the school level so this rock after getting weathered it will either remain uh, which converted into soil and that remain either near by the parent rock or they get transported if it remains near by the parent rock it is called residual soil and if it get uh, transported far away 
by wind it is called aeolian soil by sea it is called marine soil in lake it is called lacustrine in river it is called alluvial soil ice it is called glacial etc there is a various terminology so if you see that we have many chemical elements as we have seen in the very first slides there are varieties of the rock igneous sedimentation metamorphic there are various weathering effect it may be physical it may be chemical weathering depending upon the environmental condition at that particular location so looking to this permutation and combination there are varieties of the soil that uh, may form and it uh, varies from place to place depending upon the environmental condition of that particular area and hence the soil property is variable from place to place and some of the soil which we call as a problematic soils problematic soil in the sense it creates some problem and if we want to construct any structure over that we have to give some treatment so these soils are called uh, either it may be collapsible soil expansive soil it may be soft soil dispersive soil paragenic material may be slope instability etc etc there may be many today we are going to talk on expansive clay so i am not going much detail about the other type of soils if some opportunity is there i will talk regarding some collapsible soil or dispersive soils you can very well recognize this picture that when you are walking on a farm having expansive soil in a summer you will see such type of cracks these are called the shrinkage cracks so expansive soil has some characteristics we'll discuss uh, more detail in a later slides but this crack which is formed during the summer you will not find it in monsoon and also if i see the vertical section of the same pit the cracks are open more wide at the top and as we go down at uh, after some place after some depth it sees to zero there is no crack over here so this aspect is also very very important to know about it so we know that each and every structures are resting on the soil or rock it may be multi story building it may be of soft structure it may be underground structure it may be bridge or any kind of infrastructures all load are transmitted on the soil and hence we must know what is the soil characteristics is so today we'll discuss specifically on the foundations on expansive soils perhaps you may be reading the title in the is called also it is written like this actually it is a expansive soil but if you do not take care of it it becomes a expansive soil because if you put any structure on expansive soil without understanding it then later or sooner your structure will collapse or it damage very heavily and hence a repair cost it may be a structure a small structure it may be road or it may be embankment whatever it is so if we are using the uh, expansive soil then later or sooner it will become expensive so we must take care of uh, knowing the soil characteristics and hence before we undertake any project we must know whether the soil is safe or not whether the soil has any problem whether the soil is reactive like expansive soil collapsible soil dispersive soil or it is a good soil so we must know about it your structure may be anything it may be a house as shown in the slide or it may be a industrial building 
or it may be multi story building whatever it is or it may be road airport or uh, whatever runways so before you undertake any project you must know your soil by conducting fill or site investigation we go to the site we do collect the sample up to the required depth that sample we test in the laboratory looking to this laboratory test results we decide whether the soil has some problem or it is safe for the construction of the any infrastructure or road or whatever it is so based on this uh, soil sampling and laboratory test results we decide whether our uh, soil is uh, safe or not so we go to the field depending upon the size of the structure we drill the borehole we collect the sample and these samples on this type of samples we brought to the laboratory and we find out by studying their uh, results analysis uh, whether the soil is good enough or it has some diseases so as more and more land become subject to urban or industrial development good construction site and borrow areas are difficult to find and the soil improvement alternative becomes the best option technically and economically you must be saying that nowadays lot of uh, construction is going on many industries are coming and and hence every all the client or owner they want that uh, his uh, structure should be in a good soil so day by day there is a scarcity of the good soil and now the available site is more and more having some problems if you go to the south uh, gujarat side or the hit side at many places many places uh, expensive soils are available of course there are many other problematic soils are also there but we are talking today of the expansive soils so if we classify the ground improvement technique either it may be mechanical modification it may be hydraulic modification it may be physical or chemical modification or it may be modification by inclusion and confinement these are the various methods by which we perform the ground improvement technique or it may be combination of all so depending upon the site situation type of problem type of uh, environmental conditions type of equipment available sometimes what happen that uh, problematic site is very small we cannot uh, hire a big equipment for that so we have to think of this techno economical solution also for a particular site so as i told you the site investigation is very important we have to conclude whether the soil is good enough for the construction or where it has some diseases just if i simulate with medical examination that uh, whenever we become sick we go to family doctor and family doctor nowadays will not give the medicine directly he will send to the pathological laboratory in pathological laboratory we are testing uh, blood urine stool etc etc and based on that report our physician will give the medicine similarly here whenever we want to construct anything we go to the field we collect the sample as the pathologists collect the sample blood urine stool we here collect the sample of uh, soil or rock whatever is available at the site pathologist will test the sample here the collected sample we test in the laboratory and we come to a conclusion whether the soil is good or having some diseases if diseases there what kind of diseases whether it is expansive soil with a collapsible soil 
whether this perceived soil, what kind of soil is there. So depending upon the type of disease, we have to give a proper treatment. If it is a collapsible soil, there is certain treatment. If it is dispersive soil, medicines are different. If it is a loose sand, treatment is different. So for each disease, the treatment is different. So here also, depending upon the soil type, the treatment is different. So there's a jumble of ground improvement technique in general. So these are the various ground improvement techniques that we are using for uh, improving the ground depending upon the problem that we have at the site. So here in uh, expansive soil, we may go for the deep soil mixing or any other technique. We'll discuss that. You see this animation that there's a building, there's a summer, and now the monsoon comes, the rain is coming water mixed with the soil and soil creates a uplift pressure. As a result, you can see the cracking that takes place in the house because of the uplift pressure that created by the foundation soil. So this is how the expansive soil works. In summer, again, the soil will dry as uh, we have seen in the previous light, soil is dry enough in summer, in summer and having a lot of cracks and crevices because of the shrinkage. And when monsoon come, the water enters into the soil through these cracks and crevices and create a lot of uplift pressure. And as a result, you can see the change of color of the foundation soil, which creates uplift pressure. And because of that pressure, you can see the house is damaged a lot, many cracks. And if this cycle is repeated for many years, then finally you have to do either major repair or you have to uh, dismantle the house. And that is why in the title, I mentioned that if the proper care is not taken, expansive soil may become expensive. So what is the origin of the expansive soil? The first group comprises the basic igneous rock, such as basalt of the Deccan Plateau or in India, the dolerite and gabbros. In this, the feldspar and pyroxene minerals of the parent rock have decomposed to form Mont Morellonite and other secondary minerals. So from this, after decomposition, a Mont Morellonite mineral will form. The second group comprising of the sedimentary rock that contains Mont Morellonite as a constituents, which break down physically to form an expansive soil. So majority of the expansive soil is from the igneous rock. And at some location, you may find that uh, arises from the sedimentary rock. The igneous rock breaks down through the chemical weathering, it creates the clay. Weathering breaks the parent rock apart and allows the atom to recrystallize, as we have discussed in the last slide. This forms silicon tetrahedral sheet and aluminum octahedral sheets. So this is the silicon tetrahedral sheet. It is represented like this and aluminum octahedral sheet, which is represented symbolically like this. Now, how to know whether the soil is swell or not? So there's a simple test called free swell index test that we are taking a dry soil. It's not sandy, it's a clay soil. In case of sand, there is no change in volume. Say so this is sand, and below that there is a clay. 
so sandy soil is non swelling type of soil so if you take a v volume of uh, dry sandy soil and add the water volume remains more or less same so this is non expansive or non swelling soil but in case of clay if this clay dry clay is mixed with the water and if the soil is expansive in nature it will increase its volume like anything so if this expansion is more than 50% then we term this soil as an expansive soil if below that we make it it is not much uh, it is swelling soil but not much uh, harmful so this is a very simple test for if you must have studied in your uh, regular class period the another is the swell pressure swell pressure i'll discuss it at a later stage all adjoining structures on expansive soil may crack and heal when soil get wet that is what we have seen in the animation when water is gone in summer this structure can stay as damage some treatment method have to be used before construction on expansive soil so expansive soil has characteristic of swelling and shrinkage cycle when it come in contact with water it swells and when it become dry it shrinks and creates a shrinkage cracks as uh, we have seen earlier slide a photograph of the expansive soil now regarding the swell pressure we can perform this uh, swell pressure test in odometer that we put the sample in a odometer dry sample and then we weight it by water so if the soil is expansive the swelling will take place we note down the initial reading when it swells to some final reading then we start applying the load so that it will further consolidate so we go on increasing the load slowly and slowly when it when the load that is the normal stress particularly at the again the same zero stress strain level this load is called the swell pressure this load is called the swell pressure initially also zero strain it gets swell again by applying a vertical load we brought again to the same zero strain level and the load required to apply to bring it to the original level is called the swell pressure and if your structure is very light and your swell pressure is much more higher then completely uplifting of the structure will take place when it will, soil will expand during the monsoon or uh, maybe when it come in contact with the water this is another way of finding out the swelling pressure we note down the initial pressure initial strain and final strain and again it is same way uh, what, what what how much load is required to bring it to the zero strain level you can see some of the photograph of damage to of the foundation is a lightly loaded structure you can see the cracks you can also see over here basic information about the clay minerals will help understanding the swelling mechanism of the expansive soil 
so we must understand the claim means also to understand what is the basic information so there are three important group of claim minerals of course there are so many but uh, just uh, we are studying on the just three group kaolinite group not have swelling potential then uh, elite have a low swelling potential and do not create a big problems and third group schematic group mont modelonite have very high swelling potential treatment must be done before construction or special design technique must be used so this mont modelonite mineral the clay which contain this mineral shows a swelling potential so clay minerals are made up of two distinct structural unit one is called silicon tetrahedral represented by this symbols this oxygen and in between there is silicon and aluminum octahedron these are the hydro hydroxyl or oxygen atoms and in the center there is aluminum or magnesium you can see the size the several tetrahedrons several tetrahedrons join together form a tetrahedral sheet like this and this is a hexagonal hole these are the tetrahedron join together form a sheet for simplicity let's represent silica tetrahedral sheet by this particular symbol si and aluminum octahedral sheet by this particular symbol the octahedral sheet contains aluminum is also called gibbsite sometimes aluminum ion are substituted by mg magnesium and the octahedral sheet is called brucite so if there is a uh, al is there it is called gibbsite sheet instead of that if it is there is a mg magnesium then it is called brucite so if you examine the structure of clay mineral say kaolinite for kaolinite it is called one to one different combination of tetrahedral and octahedral sheet form different clay minerals if it is one to one one tetrahedral and one octahedral sheet it forms a kaolinite if two is to one clay mineral that is mont modelonite there are two tetrahedral sheets at top and bottom and sandwich a octahedral sheet that is called mont modelonite that is also the equal is two is to one because there are two tetrahedral and one octahedral in kaolinite it is also one is to one tetrahedral and octahedral so alumina si alumina si alumina si and this sit is joined by a strong hydrogen bond here in between the two sets there is a strong hydrogen bond so there is no separation when it come in contact with the water there is no much separation will take place because there is a good bond between the two sets and hydrogen bond is a very strong bond so all the sets are joined together by very strong bond called hydrogen bond and hence it is non expansive soil the clay which contains kaolin top minerals is called non expansive soil so this is the same thing that i have mentioned that uh, the layers are tightly bonded together by hydrogen bonding hold the layer tightly together leaving little to no room space for adsorption of water thus kaolinite is a non expanding clay minerals 
Now let us talk about the Mont modulo light. You can see that two is to one structure, two as SI and one uh, so one seat, second seat, all are having a light charge. SI SI there is a light charge and joined by very weak wonder walls type of bond. So when it comes in contact with water, water can easily enter into the space and create a uplift pressure and swelling. The three layer clay minerals has a structural configuration and chemical makeup, which permits a large amount of water to be absorbed in the interlayer and peripheral position on the clay crystalline, resulting in the remarkable swelling of the soil. So because of this loose, very loose bonding between these layers, water can easily enter to this. We'll see in the next slide also. Mount Moira is a highly reactive or expansive soil. Bentonite is a clay which contains uh, much or a very high portion of the Mount Moralonite. And normally this bentonite we are using for so many purposes like uh, when we drill the pile foundation for the stability of the pile borehole, we are using the bentonite mud as a uh, drilling mud for the stabilization of the borehole. Similarly for the uh, diaphragm wall also we are using a bentonite uh, drilling mud. So there are so many applications of the bentonite. You can see elite. Elite has a similar structure, two is to one. But these two layers are joined by key ions in between. And this form a little stronger bond. So kaolinite and elite are more or less non-swelling type of minerals and mon polyolinite is a swelling type of mineral. Yes, this is a comparison. Elite and Mont Moralite both has having the same similar structures, but here there's a very weak bond, wonderful type of bond, and here there's a presence of K alumina seed for a sandwich by two silica set, uh, silica seed, and uh, K ion is uh, there, which creates a very strong bond. And here we have seen there's a very strong bond, hydrogen bond, so non-swelling. Here, because of the presence of the K potassium bond, uh, no, it uh, creates a non-swelling type of soil or little swelling soil. And this mont moraline is a highly swelling soil. This is a schematic uh, representation, uh, representation of the mont moraline mineral. As water is attracted by negative charges, negative charge is always there on the clay particle edges. It pushes the mineral seat apart. And as a result, water, more and more water enters and it creates an uplift pressure or you can say swelling pressure on the foundation, which uh, damages the structures. You can see the another picture review that this is a unexpanded clay seeds. When it come in contact with water, polar water means it enters into this and it creates a swelling. So this is the initial volume and this volume you can see expanded clay. So it expands like this. Now, normally, surface area is also play a very important role. What if uh, students uh, must be knowing what is the surface area, specific surface area is. A sand particle that is 1 mm in diameter has a volume of approximately 0.5 mm cube and a surface area of 6 mm square with no electric charge 
sand is uh, having a no electric charge while clay particle is having a surface electric charge you can see the sand 1 mm diameter particle having a surface area of 6 mm square now look to the clay particles 0.002 mm diameter has a volume of 4 into 10 to the minus 9 mm cube you can compare uh, this is 0.5 mm cube this is 10 to the minus 9 mm cube so 12.5 million clay particle will fit inside the 1 mm sand particle you can see if you take 1 mm sand particle how many clay particle will be there 12.5 million clay particle will fit inside the 1 mm sand particle so you can imagine how fine the clay particles are there so each clay particle has a surface area of about 0.012 mm square therefore 12.5 million clay particle will provide 150000 mm square of surface area with negative charges now you can imagine that 1 mm of sand particle have a surface area of only 6 mm square but for 1 mm diameter there are so many clay particles 12.5 million clay particle and if you accumulate the total surface area of particle it is 150000 so now compare this so clay particle will create a lot of swelling pressure it swells like anything clay particle provide negative sides on their surface that absorb the cation that is it absorb the water how to identify the clay minerals whether it is elite clay montmorillon so one technique is using the scanning electron microscope another is uh, either x-ray deflection technique or differential thermal analysis metallurgical people are using uh, x-ray deflection and differential thermal analysis to identify the various minerals for the foundry purpose normally we are using this cassegrain chart just for the guideline purpose only that uh, if your liquid limit and plasticity index fall in this region then there is a possibility i use the word possibility of montmorillon minerals if here within this range it is elite and if this in this range it is called kaolinite so if the liquid limit and pi limit is very much high and within this range we must check for the swelling test like uh, swell index as we have discussed earlier or swell pressure test and uh, shrinkage limit these are the tests we have to perform if our liquid limit and plasticity index suggest that uh, your point is within this range then you have to do another test like uh, swell pressure free swell index and uh, shrinkage limit test so that it will confirm whether the soil is swelling type or non swelling type swelling potential of clay minerals vary a lot because each mineral has a different electric field the swelling capacity changes with the amount and type of clay minerals in the soil the arrangement and specific surface area of the clay particle and the chemistry of the soil water surrounding these particles so chemistry plays a very very important role sometimes what is happening that uh, i come across so many cases that soil is a uh, non expansive nature but because of the pollution and some uh, throw of uh, industrial waste it converted into expansive soil so chemistry plays a very very important role for that in addition to all this uh, type of clay minerals and uh, arrangement of uh, means a specific surface area of the clay particles 
So what are the factors that affect the swelling? So effect of clay content, as we discussed, effect of initial water content, and effect effect of initial dry density. These are the three basic parameters that we must know because these are the main factor on which the swelling characteristics depend on that. Clay content. Clay content means expansive clay, which contains uh, moist marolite minerals. So if the clay content is more, you can see swelling potential is increases. So as clay, it is quite obvious if you examine any soil, clay content uh, 20%, 30%. If it is a highly clay, then it may be 40%. Rift are the silt and sand, sand may be fine. So it is a combination of all the particles. But in that, if we find out the clay content is 20%, 40%, then as the clay content is increases, swelling potential is also increases. Effect of initial water content. What is the initial? Say, as I mentioned you that uh, expansive soil has a characteristic of swelling and shrinkage. It shrinks in a dry season and swells in a monsoon or when it comes in contact with water. Now initially, if the soil is dry and come in contact with uh, water, so initially it swells very high. And later stage, if there is a more water content or more uh, rain is there, then its swelling potential decreases because it has absorbed the required amount of water initially. It is just like that, that if you are in summer, if you have walked down a lot and when you come to the house, you drink a lot of water. And after some times, if somebody will give you more water, you are not able to drink more. Similarly, here also, during the initial stage, whatever moisture it absorbs, it absorbs uh, maximum and it swells maximum. Later on, there's a very small effect of increasing the water content. I uh, mean, so increasing the swelling because of the increase in water content. Effect of dry density. If the soil has a very low density, low density indicates a more words. So when it swells, when it comes in contact with water and swells, means initially all the voids will absorb the swelling pressure. So you will not be able to see on the surface. But if your soil is very dense, means voids are very low. So when it comes in contact with water, it swells. And because the voids are very low, it shows a maximum pressure at the top of the foundation, at the top of the soil. So it depends upon the initial density also. Now, this is a very, very important aspect as far as the construction of foundation is concerned. What is active zone? Active zone is the portion of the soil that experiences seasonal changes in the moisture content. See, in any season, if you go to the field, you escape the trial pit and get a uh, sample collected. You collect some sample at different uh, depth, 0.5 meter, 0.75 meter, 1 meter, 1.25 meter, 1.5 meter. You collect the sample from different depth. 
and find out the moisture content. You will find that after reaching to a particular depth, there is no much change in moisture content. It remains more or less same, provided water table is not nearby. So, the active zone is the portion of the soil that experiences seasonal changes in moisture content. So, what does it indicate? That, for example, after 2 meter depth, if you go below that, 2.5 meter, 3 meter, moisture content is more or less same, indicating that the top 2 meter from ground level to 2 meter soil is having a system effect of the seasonal change in environmental conditions. So during summer, because of the heat or the temperature, the moisture loss takes place up to about two meter depth. And hence, if you examine the vertical section of the trial pit, you can see that vertical cracks are seized after some depth because there is no moisture variation below certain depth below two meter or whatever it may be, it depends. So to determine this active zone is very, very important. Why? Why it is important? So now, suppose if you are putting your foundation in an active zone, and during monsoon, rain, when the rain comes, the soil will swell and it affects the foundation. Foundation will be also uplifted. But if you put your foundation here, there's no effect, there's no uplift pressure because there's a no moisture variation zone. Here there's no much variation. And also the top crack will be sealed when it come in contact with the water and clay is a very impermeable material. So to, to, to come the water from top to here, it will take a lot of time. So this depth is called no moisture variation zone. So if you put your foundation in no moisture variation zone, that is the below active zone, your foundation will remain safe. safe. So depth varies geographically, typically two to three meter. So if you go below two to three meter, you can put your foundation, you can rest your foundation safely without worried for the uplift pressure or swelling pressure. The depth of the active zone is influenced by the vegetation, water table, drainage and climatic condition. This two to three meter is for the guidelines. And sometimes these guidelines is misunderstood by non-geotechnical persons. Sometimes what is happening if a geotechnical expert says you put your foundation at three meter depth that is below active zone, there's no issue. So contractor will bring the JCB, excavate the three meter and keep it open for a long time. So this three meter, which he has excavated, it becomes the ground level. And from that, again, the moisture will be lost during summertime. And uh, crack will develop. And uh, again, the uh, non-active non -active zone becomes the active zone. So here, as soon as you excavate the trench for the foundation, it should be filled up immediately so that uh, there is no environmental effect takes place. So one should understand the effect uh, or the meaning of the active zone very carefully. You can see the same thing uh, over here. It should be the active zone. Below that there is no much variation in moisture content. So this is a classification of the expansive soil. So this is the colloidal content. This is a plasticity index. This is a shrinkage limit. So this is given in all the book, textbook, and uh, IS scores also. 
This is the classification of expenses or based on the activity of the clay. Activity is equal to PA upon clay content. So we can easily check the swelling potential from the activity. Activity equal to PA upon clay content. So if the activity is less than 0.75, it is inactive. If it is 0.75 to 1.25, it is normal. And if it is uh, greater than 1.25, it is well active. So provide most potential for expansive soil. So what is the possible treatment for the expansive soil? So removal and replacement. If the thickness of the expansive soil is very low, that means uh, 1 or 1 1.5 meter, you can remove and replace by good soil. Otherwise, remold it and compaction method by adding some uh, lime or cement like admixtures. Sulchat loading. Sulchat loading means uh, uh, your foundation load must be more than the swelling pressure. The counter force, counter force, swelling pressure uh, is creating upward direction. You are creating downward force by putting more load on the foundations. pre -wetting. So either you keep your soil wet by spreading the water daily, then there is no issue. But this is a very difficult to maintain it because sometimes if you are going out and uh, nobody is doing uh, wetting of the soil, it becomes dry. Chemical admixtures like uh, Flyers, uh, cement, lime, etc., etc. Chemicals are also there. It is very costly. Moisture control by barriers, electrochemical, soil treatment, and heat treatment. Normally, these are the very costly treatment. But normally, we go for chemical admixtures and moisture control by barriers. Chemical admixtures are lime, cement stabilization, soil treatment, flyers, and organic compounds. See, this is the area which consisting of the expansive soil in India. So these are the crack pattern and hue resulting from the central hue during the dry season. You can see that during the dry season, these are the exterior foundations. And this will dry first rather than this interior soil. So, because this exterior surface dry first because um, due to the environmental effect, sun will give more heat to, to uh, uh, outside rather than the inside. So this will shrink. This will shrink and creating a central heaving. So whatever uh, flooring is there, it will crack. Similarly, crack pattern and heaving resulting from age heave during the wet season. When monsoon comes, the foundation will first come in contact with the water rather than the inner soil because this is the impervious soil. Clay is impervious, so it will take some time to reach there in the center. So this will swell. As a result, the concave nature will there. So there's a cycle of convex and concave uh, uh, creating a lot of uh, damage in the flooring. So normally when we construct the house, what care we must take? So this is a dry season, lot of evaporation of water that will take place. It will shrink. During a monsoon, lot of water will enter into the soil. So as a solution, we have to collect the water downpour and we have to see that it will not remain collected nearby the foundations. It will be drained much away, at least about three to four meter away by constructing a impervious apron all around the building. Building may be any industrial building or any kind of building. 
so that care we have to take that water should not be accumulated nearby the foundation so with the help of this apron in previous apron water should be uh, diverted at uh, far from the foundation system the tree is also not a less element you can see because of the evaporative translation of the water from the root zone, you can see there is a shrinkage or settlement. Shrinkage settlement will take place nearby. So if any structure is there nearby, it will shrink. You can see such type of cracks that develop into the building. Is the one building near Ankleswar? Effect of vegetation. Trees can remove large amount of water from the soil, and it will desiccate, and can increase the depth of the constant soil moisture. Effect of tree increases with age of tree and drop. Removal of existing tree can result in re-wetting and heave of soil. So these trees are also very much uh, dangerous. I will show you by this animation that nearby our building, we like to plant a tree. Everybody likes uh, gardening. So there is a small tree first year. After 30 years, it grown up, it gave a fruit, but the root zone is increases like anything. And as a result, you can see the desiccated root zone. It the uh, soil is shrinks like this. Soil is shrinks. Subsidence of the ground surface due to the soil shrinkage. So this is a dotted line is the initial ground level which shrinks. Now some contractor came, want to construct a new house. So he removed the tree without removing the roots. And he lying the floor over here. He started the foundations. He has constructed the house. And because of the root, soil hydrates, rehydrates, and it's pretty heavy. Foundation and house cracks from differential movement. Field foundation and house also heave over the root zone. You can see. Then new tree is being planted over this house, nearby the house. And again, the root causes a lot of problem of uh, subsidence of the ground to this house. You can see, you can see how near the tree is there. See in one of the industries, the floor is damaged. And when we inspire, in, you can see the initial cracking on the top of the floor and just to inspect this, why the floor is cracked. Of course, the soil was expansive in nature. And when we expose by taking the core, you can see the root zone, which is not removed by the contractor. So at what distance we should plan? Uh, and if you want to plan, uh, plan any uh, tree, at what distance we should uh, grow the tree? So depending upon the type of tree, a safe distance is there. The one edge, one uh, the edge is the mature height of the tree. Edge is the mature height of the tree. So depending upon the type of tree, how much distance you have to keep, that is also we have to see. You could not uh, plant this uh, tree very much near to this foundation, otherwise it will damage. So these are the, some of the servant uh, quarters, lightly loaded structures. You can see heavily cracked. You can see the crack size. Snake can easily enter 
to this crack. You can see the cracks over here. Finally, we uh, demolish this quarter, but you can see expensive soil become expensive soil. So designing a structure on soil susceptible to volume change. So one is to alter the soil, compact the soil well on the weight side of the OMC, control the direction of expansion, control the soil water, check whether the granular blanket will control capillary water, load the soil to sufficient pressure intensity to balance the soil pressure. That is to balance the upward and downward pressure. The soil engineer should not accept job in an expansive soil area, which will not allow a thorough soil subsoil investigation. So what I mean to say that we must know whether the soil is expansive or not. If it is expansive as an engineer, we should not be afraid. We have to adopt a proper foundation technique or proper ground improvement technique, as we have discussed earlier. One of the technique is CNS layer that you can use for the construction of the canal or for the road purpose. These are the moisture control, control barriers. You can have a soak pit uh, through which uh, you can collect the water so that whatever water is there that is being collected over here and it, it will not affect the foundations. So horizontal moisture barrier that is the apron Vertical moisture barrier, that is this soap pit or any kind of pit below the foundation depth. Subsurface drainage or surface drainage. The intention of surface drainage is to throw away the water well away from the foundation system. So these are the various, you can see the impervious uh, barrier and these are the drainage, this is the impervious apron. So if any external water is there, it will collect it into this perforated pipe and ultimately it will be thrown away. These are the another system that we adopt for the foundation in the expansive soil. This will collect the water and it will not uh, let it in inside the building. This is uh, a impervious layer. So underlying pile foundation is the best solution for construction of foundation in expansive soil. So underlying pile means pile with a bulb is called underlying pile. So depending upon the load condition, either it's a single bulb, two bulb, or it may be multiple bulb like this. So with the help of a special auger, we go up to the particular depth and with this mechanism, we open out this auger. It will rotate and create a bulb. We put the reinforcement and do the concreting and that is how the underring pile is being constructed. If a load is more, instead of one bulb, we create a two bulb or three bulb. And this bulb will act as an anchorage against the expansive or the swelling nature of the soil. This will not allow the uh, structure, superstructure to be get uplifted under the swelling pressure of the soil. So this act, bulb act as an anchor for the upliftment. And it will act as in a foundation system for the downward movement of the load. So this is the, one of the hospital at the Ankleswar. You can see very lightly loaded structure. You can see there are a lot of uh, gardening and uh, tree nearby the foundation. You can see the another view. So many trees are there nearby. And you can see the hospital building, semi deluxe room. So many cracks are there at the top. You can see the flooring is also getting separated. 
you can see the sorry closely you can see the tiles is also break because of the swelling pressure so with this i thank you i hope i have covered everything well within the time so over to organizers hello am i audible sir yeah yes sir uh, thank you so much sir for your valuable knowledge our uh, students are getting a more knowledge towards the black cotton soil or its expansive soil because we have seen in the particularly theoretical way but right now you have given your practical exposure that is very beneficial for our students those who are going for the minor project as well as major project in the last semester also so i would like to thank sir uh, hod dr lalit thakur sir to providing this opportunity to me to moderate this webinar and i would like to again thank you so much sir for coming over here as in form of an online webinar this platform and thank you so much for your valuable knowledge to us okay thank you thank you very much thank you sir okay bye no okay, sir Mm-hmm.